Okay, let's, I'm going to get started. It's like a few seconds until <laughs> 1.15. So, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Thompson. I am from University of Washington, Bothell, where I work as, uh, my title is a Learning and Access Designer. Uh, it was, it uh, migrated from that, uh, to that from learning technologist. Um, and uh, um, I work for a department uh, who, uh, for the most part, had been supporting faculty with LMS, with that training, uh, a lot of the technology tools that we use in teaching, and uh, used to be under IT. Now we are just under academics, our own department, and we keep expanding the things we do. Um, one of my passions that has been not only in my current institution, but in previous institutions, uh, has been accessibility. You know, making sure that everyone has a, um, an accessible experience, and also doing training. So enabling others to create accessible content. I got started 30, like a few seconds early, so you're fine. <laughs> OK. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today and th this afternoon is um, with uh, when, we, when we encounter challenges. I mean, it's an ongoing thing, and it has been for a while, when we train faculty or even staff. And as I mentioned in my presentation from yesterday, it's like, you know, said people go, yeah, when are you going to have a workshop on this? And you go, yes, I'll have a workshop. And then you have the workshop, and, and what happens, right? Yeah? They don't, they don't, yeah, exactly, they don't come. It's like, people, you wanted this. You asked for this. <laughs> um, so, um, oh, I went too far. So, I mean, in, so usually, in person seems to be like the richest experience you can provide one-on-one -on -one. so if you can work with somebody they make an appointment and then you or you go and meet with somebody right it uh, it's not sustainable when you're talking about you support a large number of people and so whenever you can go with group or you can maximize yourself it works much much better so from in person to online to perhaps other ways so what, what sort of ways have you found successful or semi-successful in training? What kind of models? You know, you want to uh, Oh, their office hours, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, right faculty meeting or department meeting or college school meeting, right? Okay, yeah, that, that's a great, yes. You should you get their attention. Then, okay, okay, any others? Online. Yeah, online, okay, so. We have a little studio, the, the faculty studio, and we'll go in there and, and create little tidbits mm -hmm. of training IT department and send it out. Okay, and then you just, you, pub, you publish it, you post it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On our internet. Oh, okay. Do you, yeah. and do you have accompaniments like uh, handouts or things like that with it, with that training, or just a video? Yeah, usually just a video. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we have a okay. knowledge base that we put stuff on, mm -hmm. and they can go to that knowledge base, but sometimes we'll attach stuff. Just depends on what the content is. Okay. And then when you get questions that yeah. have already been asked, you just send them that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Easy. Okay, excellent, excellent. Any others? In other ways, how you uh, support and train faculty or st and or staff? Yes. <laughs> Such as? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, because e yes, there is. Because even if the tool is easy to use, there's always like a, the right way to use it and the wrong way to use it. You know. At the very least. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so um, and I keep on going forward. So I'm going to set that down for a second. Oh, we must be crossing yeah. beams again. Look at that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So good thing I only have a few slides. <laughs> okay. So, um, so anyway, so we talked about online, right? Um, putting up on a website, intranet, um, in person. And um, so one thing that we've done that has worked well is we do a lot of ad hoc using Zoom. 
And we do that from taking a phone call, someone needs help, we connect and have a mini training session. Or we schedule like 15, 20 minutes, like uh, quick tips, or whether it's on Zoom or Poll Everywhere, or um, how to create a, a, you know, how to beautify your course by creating a, a welcoming homepage for your course, things like that. And it's just very short, and we do it via Zoom. Most of the time it's one-on-one, -on -one, but at the very least, we're not going around crazy and anyone can join. And when are the ones that are advertised. Uh, so, you know, it's something that we continue working on, trying to reach and meet faculty and staff where they are so they can get what they need. But everyone is so busy and crazy anymore. So, a couple of courses that, that we've created in terms of accessibility training, you know, we have all of these requirements, legal and at this end, in Washington, we have a, a, a state policy, and our university has also a policy for accessibility. The, our state policy came out in 2006, policy 188, and it was uh, put out by the, uh, the state CIO. And uh, we uh, were required to have a coordinator for each um, organization that was under the state for state employees, and as well as a plan, at minimum. And so as part of that, we, uh, we also have been trying to find ways to do training for accessibility. So one of the ways that we did, we created a series of 20 minutes a day for five days fully online, and we call them workouts. So this is the second one in the series. The first one just touched a little bit on Canvas, little things on Canvas, but it was basically we put out like some, some sort of really cool article, a little discussion or a little try this thing or that thing and some interaction. So very low stakes. So, and, uh, so I'm gonna show you that one first. The other course is Accessibility 101, four weeks fully online. And people spend anywhere between two and five hours a week doing it, accessing the materials. And the Accessibility 101 has a certificate at the end if they complete and get at least 85%. So, um, so I'm gonna switch here. Go away, okay. All right. Okay, so both of these courses, by the way, are available at the canvas.instructure.com website and they're public, so anyone can access this content. And they are also shared in the Canvas Commons. Um, so, let me go and access this to the view. Okay, so this is the five-day accessibility workout. And uh, the funny thing is, we copied a lot of the content from uh, Learning and Innovation, uh, Channel Islands. When we created our first course, which is a, a Canvas workout, they were so excited and we shared the content with them and they created one. And we told them we were creating an accessibility one next. So they beat us to the punch. And then they say, hey, we finished ours. We'll share it with you. So they shared it back. <laughs> and then we customized it. Um, but uh, uh, so what we did here, we had uh, you know, a, welcome, a welcome message. And then, and then just uh, a very simple homepage that went to all the different days that were set up in modules in Canvas. And, um, Try to make it very, very easy to use. So these were the topics that we visited. Text formatting, videos, which video captioning. Uh, we uh, helped them learn about color contrast, alt text in images, and then how to extend time in quizzes. Some, some real basic things in accessibility in Canvas. Okay, so this is day one, uh, text formatting. So it goes through some, uh, some content, some basic content that they can read in no time, and um, how to do things, and then some demonstrations, how to do things as well, so visual and text format. So we try to apply uh, not only universal design for learning principles in, when creating this, but also we apply quality matters. So all of uh, this course, it, um, it follows all those principles. In this case, you know, we even added um, some animated GIFs to do super quick demonstrations. Okay, 
So then at the very bottom of each day, it shows how this course meets quality matter standards. Because we use courses like this to also demonstrate that it's really not that hard. It is possible to create a, a course following these best practices. So we just usually told them, hey, just go next at the bottom of the page. And then the activity related to, to day one, it was basically a discussion. And uh, so, uh, so then we, uh, we, put the, we linked the instructions on how to, how to do a discussion if they have not done it as a student, but they've done it only as an instructor. It was a good experience for them, and as we know, you know, that if they get, they're better off by seeing both of those sides, right? Okay. So, so by going next, then, you know, we tell them, hey, you finished day one, woohoo. Try to make it fun and silly, right? It just, and, and in a way to make it, so it's low stakes, very relaxed, uh, and, uh, and so, then we give them a previous, like, okay, day two is going to be about this other thing. So in this case, it's video captioning. Uh, so here we mentioned that uh, that study done at Oregon State University. You probably heard about that, and three play media on if students have access to transcripts and captions, even if they don't have a disability, they will use it to enhance their learning experience. So we talk about options, and all this information is customized for University of Washington Bethel, right? Uh, some institutions have captioning service centralized and so forth. Um, we don't, except for uh, a, a, there's a project on the side doing that, but for the most part, we have people either submit it or, on, or um, teach them how to caption. As well as in this course, we try to point them out to uh, library resources. When they're looking for, um, for content to add to their courses. Why not look for content that's already accessible, that is already captioned? So we pointed them to a couple of things. Uh, Canopy is really cool, and then if you find a movie you want to use and it's not captioned, you can always submit it for captioning, and then it goes. Usually, the turnaround is about a week, week and a half, and you get a captioned copy. And it's captioned for everybody else, not just you. So we go a little bit over Amara. Um, using Amara, um, and then the quality matters at the bottom. So have you guys done any sort of training like this in your institutions? Mm -hmm. You have? You want to share? Mm -hmm. Great, great. And then how do you offer that training? And how do you track that? Excellent, excellent. Yeah, no.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So uh um, at the University of Nevada Las Vegas we're currently coming up with an interest policy. Mm-hmm. Um I was with our online education office last year and we highlighted um their current paradigm in effect right now is this eight hour training, which would totally in effect if they just walk through a canvas shell and after eight hours of this you we don't gain anything. I mean, I really like this. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. And and uh, you know, and uh, there's so much research out there that shows and demonstrates how chunky materials more effective. And it's not just our young students, you know, that uh, after seven minutes or so, their uh, attention span decreases dramatically, but also our faculty and our staff. You know, we're all human beings, so we have to think about those things, how we can maximize. And chunking is a, is a great, great idea. And making things smaller, bite size. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go real quick over uh, the other ones. And, uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, so in this one, uh, no, only in the, in the quizzes, we basically had them do a quiz in their own courses, right? But in this one, there was not much assessment per se. It was more of a very laid back, lazy flare, lazy flare. Anyway, very loose <laughs> practice. Yes, yes, this one. The other course does have assessments built in, right? Uh, because, uh, okay, so, so in this one, uh, we, we have an activity connected or an as with each uh, part of each lesson. And as people go forward, we, you know, we just have them go next, or they can go to the home page and, whoa, you finished day two or day three. So after each one, we tell them they can go to the water cooler if they want to discuss, if they have questions. So it continues in the same pattern. So just really quick. So this one is color contrast and uh, this is a video done by Channel Islands, uh, one of their people there, and it was, she did such an awesome job. She says, oh, go ahead and use it. So we, we left it in there. And it talks about basic principles uh, of color contrast and some tools that they can use. So we tried to expose them to a little bit of things that they can do and some examples. Okay, and then, uh, so, here, well, I guess I like. There's a little quiz here, but it's low stakes, right? It's low stakes. It's not connected to um, to uh, to any assessment in grades, so they can, you know, not don't have to fail or anything. But it basically has them go over some some colors and see if there's enough contrast, and they can use the tool if they want. Okay, so all right. So if you access uh, if you access the class, then you'll be able to to take it and and practice if you want. Okay, uh, let's see. So then, so then day four. Okay, images. So it's all text. Uh, so uh, it goes through, and it's um, it's funny. We had this, this uh, training, and then some of the questions we got is like. There's a school box and the content. How do you do that? <laughs> Which is, you know, a lot of times, you know, you try to expose them some cool things that they could be doing. And so it, it was fun to see some of them interested in, in doing something like that with divs and it's still accessible. So it just goes through, uh, you know, all the settings in Canvas, et cetera. Okay. And then, uh, then what, uh, 
what we created basically, this is just a wiki page. They could upload a, 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 a picture and then some alt text just as a practice that they could do as a class. And reinforcing some of the instructions. Okay, and then, then the last one, okay, it was just the quizzes and we just walk them through the, the different kinds of quizzes and then how to add accommodations. So very, very simple. Okay, and different scenarios. So they could practice. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, accessibility workout. 20 minutes a day for five days. Uh, the next one, okay, before moving to the next one, any questions or comments? No? Okay, all right, we'll keep moving. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, it's, it's freely shared, so anyone can access it um, and import it into Canvas. Okay, so this one, uh, let me go to the student view. And I access denied, why? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me get student view here. I know, right? That has to be it. It was published. I don't know why it's when it was. Oh, there it is. I don't know what that was. Okay. So, um, so in this one, I just had like one announcement showing in this class. The, the last iteration of this class was offered the month of March. The next one is going to be this June. Um, and uh, so basically, we had uh, four weeks of, of content. We have the start here or module, basically module zero with information about the course, a full syllabus, and it was required for everyone to take that before they could move on. Bless you. So it goes just from the home page onto modules. And, uh, um, and as you can see, this is a, a little bit more robust than the prior course. It goes through the welcomes and the, the syllabus and the, uh, talking about how it's organized. Uh, my information, and um, they get to do a one-minute intro survey, for which I use a Google form. Okay, and some introductions. Okay, and then uh, we always had available a Q&A discussion form and some accessibility FAQs. And let me show you a little bit what we put in the FAQs. This format right here is what we did for all the lessons. Okay. But these are some of the things that we address. So uh, whether or not uh, students with disabilities can get an excuse for not completing things, uh, how can I make things exciting and creative but also accessible, okay? Should I not show videos if I have a deaf student? Okay, am I required by law <laughs> to make things accessible? Uh, so I don't create my course content but I get it from a publisher and so who is responsible? So just addressing some of those big questions, okay? Um, okay. So, okay, so let's just go next. All right, so week one, okay? So each, each module and each week has like an overview. It has the lesson, and within the lesson, the lesson is usually set up in, in different parts, so you have the the basics and then you're going to have what what you need to learn about it there's some videos and then exploration if you want to explore further okay so this starts with that uh, why accessibility matters so next okay we're stuck in a loop oh i know what it is okay let me leave some of you i need to turn that off the, re, uh, the requirement on the modules uh, for people to complete where they have to complete all of the items, that's why it's stopping, stopping me from moving forward, but I'll do it from here. Okay, so here is, um, so the accessibility basics is what's part of week one. So a lesson on accessibility, why accessibility matters, types of disability and barriers, difference between access and accommodation, and then there's, there's always a check your understanding type activity in each lesson, each week. Also talks about assistive technology and universal design. 
relevant lesson policy. And then as part of the module assessment, usually there's always a quiz that is required. And then they have some sort of assignment. Sometimes they get, a, they have to choose between option A and B, or choose two out of three or two out of four. And they, so they can show, choose a, diff, a mode that is, more, that is more fitting to them. And always questions. In some of the lessons, there, there's also extra credit available. Uh, so the, week, the second week, then it works with basically documents. Microsoft Office, and it touches a little bit on PDFs. PDFs is such a big subject, so whenever I get the chance, I try to help people be discouraged to use PDFs. People don't realize how inaccessible they are, even when we do everything right from the get-go, even if we make them uh, text-based, because we're so used to using PDFs was the answer for everything, because people didn't have office, or they didn't have easy access to office, and aside from Printing is easy to download, easy to print. So Adobe captured the, mar the market with that, didn't they? <laughs> so they, they still have us captured. But um, so I always tell people, it's like, before you make a PDF, ask yourself, does this need to be a PDF? Can it be an office document? Can it be a web page? And, and in Canvas, can this be a Canvas page? So yes, yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, so let's say you, your source document is a Word document, which is usually the case, right? And you do save as PDF. And let's say in your Word document, you did add headings, and you have alt text. When you save it in the Windows environment, if you don't check a little box in the options window, in the, in the save as window, it, the tags for accessibility option is not checked then those tags or that structure doesn't get saved. So it's basically, for someone who can't see it, it's a jumble of words with no sections and organization, okay? So even if you do it right and you have applied and you save the tags and you end up with a tag PDF, the content might be in different order. Sometimes it happens, things get jumbled a little bit when in the PDF creation process and perhaps the way that it reads for us, we just go top to bottom, you know, left to right. But content sometimes gets jumbled and it may jump to like the fourth paragraph before going to the title. And that's very disorienting for someone who can't see it, who's using like, technology to be able to access their content. And those things have to be fixed manually in Adobe Acrobat Pro or, or other tool. But Adobe Acrobat Pro is still the gold standard, unfortunately. Uh, there are other emerging tools, but they're not there yet. So it does in a nutshell. Um, so, so, uh, so this act goes over all of the prints, the basic principles. So it's reviewing a little bit from before, but also, you know, talking about all the basic principles in terms of uh, what makes accessible content. Okay. So basic principles: use the programs like you're supposed to, right? Make sure you use, use alt text, use headings, use the built-in list. Don't just create your own list by putting one period, right? That type of thing. Create things with structure. So it goes through all of those. And this is a very consistent uh, organization scheme that is used in all of the lessons. with a lot of images, and yes, the images do have alt text in them, um, and then always some videos to support the content, so people can watch some of those, and then also explore. Okay. Okay, so let me just go to the modules. I did leave the modules option available so people can just jump directly to the modules as they're navigating the course. Okay, so then we just saw week two. We also address PowerPoint, because PowerPoint is a little bit different than Microsoft Word, and in some of the things that not only make a, a, a PowerPoint file accessible, also um, the tools that are built in into Office, the accessibility checker, for example, as well as the way that you can access the selection pane to check the order of how things are read. 
Okay, so the next, the following week just goes over accessible email and accessibility in Canvas. And here's an example on the assessment where people can choose two out of four of the, of the, of the activities for the assessment. But they all need to take the quiz. Or I mean, sorry, two out of three. But they all need to take the quiz. And in this one, there's an extra credit and uh, about finding VPADs for technologies. Okay. The last week is a little bit light, and, but it basically starts to bring everything together and has people create a plan for their area, a personal plan for their department as well for the institution. How are they going to do their part to move accessibility forward? <coughs> Okay, so aside from that, there's some extra additional uh, uh, content that is completely optional. So a little bit more touching to PDF accessibility, web accessibility, as well as the standards, YCAG, and a little bit of history up to 2.1, and a few more lessons. I, I didn't get to finish the math STEM accessibility. That's a difficult one, but uh, they, we do have a creating accessible spreadsheets content if people want to check it out. So that in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's the two courses that we have, that we have uh, developed so far for accessibility training. Aside from that, I have been doing a lot of e small group or one-on-one -on -one PDF remediation training. What do I say first? Does this need to be a PDF? And they go, but we, ha we have to. It is an application, it's still an application, or it's, it has uh, private information. It's like, okay, okay. If you have to, you're going to have to do all this stuff to make it accessible. Because, okay, so what, in term, what is in terms of accessibility, what is the order, what is the most accessible type of content or document? Does anybody know? A what? TXT. TXT? Yeah, text, but. How about HTML? Mm -hmm. Right, right, very good. So, um, so HTML, if it is set up with any content, that's absolutely right. So something formatted well. So HTML, which will come in, in as plain text, right? Okay, what will be the second one, you think? <laughs> you fail, man. <laughs> you wish it was PDF. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that, what's that? The question I was asking, what is the order of accessibility, basically? What is the most accessibility, accessible type of document? Okay, so HTML, text, and then over here you said document, office document, well formatted, right? We have our headings and we have our alt text, all those basic principles, okay? So we have those two. Okay, so imagine this is, you know, HTML, Office Documents. PDF is like right here. Okay, see? And PDF forms is like below the ground, like in hell, by the devil. That's a level of accessibility. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. So all of these challenges, is like, I think that it's uh, having people know and realize the PDFs is no longer the answer for everything, but it's actually an obstruction for many, many people. Okay, even when they're the best of intentions. For example, instructors scanning content from books, a chapter or two, right? Fair use, that's fine. But they're image PDFs. We have Ally added into Canvas. And anyone using Ally? Have you a Blackboard Ally at all? I don't know what Tiger is. Oh, yeah, we're in the same boat then. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you. So, um, Ally, it is a Blackboard product. It's an add-in that you can add to an LMS. You can add it to Blackboard. I'm not sure if it's available for Moodle. I have not checked on that, but it's also, it is? Moodle? No, Sakai, that's right, you guys are on Sakai, that's right. So it is, it is for Canvas, so we, University of Washington purchased the license last uh, summer and we implemented it. So Ally has three parts. We have the student side, the instructor side, and the institution side. 
So the student side basically gives the opportunity for students to uh, request alternate formats. So they have a PDF, they can have a, a tag PDF, they can have a HTML or text file, they can also get an MP3. But what happens if that PDF is, an, is an image file? It's nothing that technology can do with that, right? So it is a great thing, but it, it fails if people don't do their part. And they don't, they don't realize they're not doing their part. They have the best intentions in mind, like saving students money, so they don't have to buy a book to read just two chapters. So I've been working a lot with instructors, one-on-one, -on -one, and sharing with them best practices for scanning. So, um, but yeah, um, uh, so, so there have been, so I have probably, I have probably remediated, uh, and, and that means made accessible fully, probably about 300 PDFs on our campus. Uh, eventually, I keep on encouraging people to switch to something else. Um, and uh, I do do uh, remediation or make accessible type of accommodations for, for students, last minute ones. So I get pulled in for that, so. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah, but why? If you tell them why, they always convert it to PDF. What's the usual answer? What answer have you? Have, what do you think they would say? What? Hold the format. Okay, that's one. What's another? Do you know of another answer that they might give? Why they convert it to a PDF automatically? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yes, yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> maybe it's my maybe it's my accent. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. And and just what you said, right? You said PDFs. Yeah, because to make it more accessible. We're not talking about accessible in terms of accessibility, but about access to be able to grab it, be able to download it, be able to print it easily, right? So we're, those words are used very interchangeably for different things. And we have for many years. So it takes a change of culture. You know, we need to change and be better. Um, but another thing that usually when I ask faculty, why do you convert this for, to PDF? Okay, my number one answer is, I don't want students changing the syllabus. They're gonna change it, and it's like, Okay, and so that's why you don't leave it as a Word document. Yeah, it needs to be static. And I go, oh, really? Why don't you do a Canvas page? Put it right on Canvas. That would be static. <laughs> and they go, what? <laughs> and then, and then you know, the thing I bring up is like, and then how many times you have to update your syllabus during the quarter or semester? And then that means you have to go to the Word document, make the changes, to convert it to PDF and upload the new PDF, and hopefully you, up, you link the right link, right? It's not the old one. If it's on Canvas, you just update it and it's done. There's another benefit. Uh, are you familiar, well, in, in, in LMSs you can always create an HTML page, right? In Canvas, it's just called a Canvas page. And there's another advantage in Canvas, something really cool that happens. One of the basic principles of accessibility, carrying accessible content, is create descriptive hyperlinks. Are you, do you know what that is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so instead of saying go to www.google.com, mm -hmm. say go to Google, the search engine, and Google, a search engine, and click a hyperlink. 
behind it, exactly. So you're telling them what, they, what it is for, right. So do you know why we should use descriptive hyperlinks? <gasps> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, and I will expound on that. Oh, he said this, descriptive. I should be repeating, sorry. You're right, yes. He said descriptive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, it is more usable when you read something as, as a person who can see and you have your full faculties that you have a link that says what it is, right, for anybody. For someone who's using a screen reader, for example, they are reading their content all along, and this is a link to HTTP, and it gets read that way, colon, slash, slash, and then it could be a bunch of gibberish. Some pages are more understandable, more meaningful than others. Those links, some are not. I mean, have you looked at a link for a Google Doc lately? I mean, it just, uh, it's very confusing. So, so <clears throat> for someone using uh, a screen reader, the way it's read is, it announces that it's a link, it says what it is for, and it takes them there. So, they, or they can go, choose to go there, versus reading the URL itself. So, so, um, so that, uh, oh, and I was going to, I mentioned that so I can tell you this. Uh, in, uh, HTML pages or Canvas pages, if you create descriptive hyperlinks, students and you, that's how, let's say, how, that's how the syllabus is shared for the class. You can, uh, a student goes and, and, and prints it or they're gonna save a PDF of it, they can, absolutely. The, the URLs get printed next to what it is. Because instructors always say, yeah, but they're gonna lose the link. No, they don't, not in Canvas. So it's a cool thing that happens. So, um, what questions do you have? What other questions do you have? Yes? Um, do you mind going back to the, to the URLs? Yes, of course. Let's see if it's in the same, there we go. Mm -hmm. So those are bit the links for the first one is for the class itself in the free Canvas website. All you need is the, if you don't have a free account, just create one and you can access. The second one is for, in each one is for uh, uh, Canvas Commons. There is a backup of the class share there that can be downloaded and it can be uploaded into a Canvas shell. So you get a copy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, using the word mandate is like required. What and faculty, you know, those, they don't get along with that. <laughs> Mandatory. I mean, isn't that the, isn't that the case? Yeah. So uh, no, I don't. I haven't seen anything aside from the fear of being sued. But that should not be the reason why we're telling people that they should do this. It is the right thing to do. You know, we should provide equal access to everyone. We should always do better, be better, right? We're in education, for crying out loud. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So we all know handicaps are supposed to have accessibility, whatever that handicap is. But when you go to your work, you don't think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. It's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> right. But uh, but it is something that we need to bring up and, and talk to people about. Right. We all benefit from from things in design accessible for everyone, not just people with disabilities. The curbs, like just you mentioned, right? The road curb there, or sidewalk, those uh, slanted curbs. Um, buttons that are accessible or unusable. Uh, PDFs where you can, let's say you want to do it on your computer or your tablet or your phone, and you want to be able to annotate that PDF. You can't do that uh, or if it's not an accessible PDF, or you know, at least text-based. 
right? So uh, it's kind of like our university needs to have a forced harassment class. <laughs> so you kind of have to be something like that in the academic class. And so it's all new faculty, you're all faculty, you'll take those Right. So we need, we need buy-in. Because if it comes down from the bottom, I mean from the top, from the top, right? From uh, you know, from presidents, from chancellors, uh, uh, from deans, and part of that should be not not to scare people to death, or you better take this or else. But but if you do it, it helps you professionally as well. I mean, you are you're growing and you're creating more content that's accessible, but also will matter when you apply for promotion, for tenure. So we need support to embed those things in and provide more of that little carrot. And that's something we're working on our campus and it's getting better. We started conversations about three years ago and uh, it's, uh, taking out, uh, it's been taken off like a wildfire. So slowly we're getting there. <laughs> but it will happen, just have to start somewhere, right? Okay, I don't have anything else. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>